The next paper is entitled Neutral Winds and Energy Dissipation Rates at the Auroral E Region by Jay Dupnik. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, a slightly different topic, and which is a little different in the abstract that's in the, uh, in the bulletin. Uh, and I'm going to concentrate on, on dual heating rather than on neutral winds. I think most of you have heard the story on neutral winds from measurements at Chattanooga before. And uh, I'll skip over the majority of that and talk about the part that's more of interest to this conference, which is the amount of energy being coupled between the magnetosphere and the ionosphere. Uh, so on, on the first slide, to introduce what I'm going to talk about, Technique is a radar, as you know, and it measures the line of sight velocity of the plasma at successive altitudes and uh, the electron density profile. And from the uh, top line, we can compose an ion velocity vector and from that, we can deduce in the, in the F region what the drift electric field is transverse to the, the magnetic field. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, if we go down one line, we can uh, look at the E region drift velocities and uh, couple that with the electric field and the collision frequency. We can find out what kind of neutral winds are required to explain the, the observed E region ion drifts. And, and going down one step further, we can uh, take the electron densities and the ion neutral collision frequency. We have to use a model for the collision frequency and uh, calculate conductivities, which is of some interest in itself. Um, we can calculate currents by taking the conductivities and using the electric field, which exists as we measured here on the ground, coupled with the neutral wind velocity cross V, which is an effective but not a real electric field as we see it directly overhead, and calculate the current density and we've done this some time ago. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is the uh, last three lines, which are the joule heating rates, which is normally written as J.E or J.E prime, depending on the papers you read, and is really the, the current dotted with the, the forcing function, in this case electric field plus the neutral wind effects expressed as V neutral cross P. And uh, it turns out that sigma P, the Patterson conductivity, is the important parameter here. And uh, the electric field neutral wind enters the square. We can decompose this into two parts, and I'll, I'll show you on the slides the, the decomposition plus the, the total joule heating rate. Um, the work done by the electric field is simply J dot E, which is what we're accustomed to dealing with, resi with resistors and, and similar things. And uh, if you'll notice, the J itself involves neutral wind. It's electric field plus V neutral cross B that enters into J. And so uh, it's not just a pure electric field part. And similarly, the work done by the neutral wind is J dot V neutral cross P. So on, on the next slide, I'll, I'll begin to show a little data of what's going on here. This was a quiet day in, in July of 1972, and uh, we've plotted at the top the conductivities, Hall and Patterson. And if you can't read it, the scales in Mohs, and it goes from 0 to 20 at the top, Hall and Patterson. And the electric field is in the middle, the two components, the northward, the pluses, and the, the eastward, the, the square boxes. Um, and you can see that there was a fair amount of activity there in the beginning of the evening. And that's uh, six hours UT, which is four hours before local midnight in Chattanooga, Alaska. So midnight is 10 hours UT, and I, you probably can't read the, the time scale on the bottom. That's a 24-hour experiment. Uh, beneath the electric field on the, on the bottom box is the V neutral cross B, neutral wind velocity cross B, expressed as an equivalent electric field. And you can see that, in fact, it's, it's relatively large at this time which is in the, uh, oh, about 5 o'clock in the morning, and is comparable to the magnetospheric electric field at that time. And it, later on in the day, the magnetospheric field is quite small, which is to say that Chattanooga is far away from the auroral oval, sitting either inside the plasma sphere or very close to it. And the effects of the neutral wind are quite large, a large velocity. Just uh, to take this one step further, the, the joule heating rate expressed on the top box is calculated for this day, and it's very small. It was a quite a quiet day, uh, less than one erg per square centimeter per second, which is what the, the units are on the top there. Um, down beneath, I plotted the, the work done by the electric field, J dot E, and uh, you'll notice that that's also comparable but small, and beneath that, the work done by the neutral wind, J dot V neutral cross B. And a point that's worth mentioning here is that uh, you have to add these two to form that, which is what we said before. You'll notice that there is a, a negative excursion which persists for some time. It's a real effect. And it says the work done by the sources of electric field is negative. In other words, there's work being done on the sources of electric field 
and which we attribute to uh, uh, the neutral wind acting on the ions in the E region. In other words, it's a dynamo. And so this is a, it's a real effect of the, what we normally call a dynamo is an object doing work on something else. A, a more characteristic day of, of events in the, in the auroral zone uh, is expressed here on the 13th and 14th of, of uh, October 1972. Uh, the conductivities, as you can see at night, which is in the center of the plot, are enhanced greatly by precipitating particles. Uh, the hall is on the top, the Patterson is beneath it. And the electric field in the middle shows several large excursions, two in the, in the evening sector, which are due to expansions of the oval. They may be substorms, but that requires a bit more sophisticated identification. And finally, the oval expanded late in the evening, and uh, the uh, precipitation became quite intense. The field strengths here peak at about 40 millivolts per meter. And one millivolt per meter is equivalent to about 20 meter per second drift velocity of the plasma across the field. Now for this day, which is, as I say, more typical, the heating rates uh, are quite a bit larger. They, uh, they peak above 10 ergs per square centimeter per second. And uh, if you recall, the electric field in this time in, in here, I really can't see that. Uh, electric field in here was about the same strength as it was at this time, which is a large peak. Yet the heating rates are quite a bit different, uh, obviously due to the influence of the conductivities. Precipitating particles enhance the E region at night, and the heating rate is consequently larger. Uh, a point that's worth mentioning is that the, uh, the work done by the, the neutral wind, which is in the bottom here, is comparable. It's measured in ergs per square centimeter per second to the work being done by the electric field. If I had blown up the scale, you would have seen in the daytime that there were small excursions of the E field work plus and minus, which means the neutral wind is pushing the ions around. Now, on this same day, I've taken a, an example and shown the, the altitude profile of the joule heating rate. This was during that large major peak in the middle of the night. The heating rate's a dark curve and versus altitude, and it peaks at about 125 kilometers. Uh, and I'm just for comparison's sake, in case somebody asks me a question, I put in the electron density profile uh, raw from the, from the radar. Um, the point of this curve is really that the heating profile seems to have this general shape, uh, more or less day or nighttime, precipitation or no, except during very odd situations. And the altitude of that uh, peak seems to float up and down about five kilometers or so. And it's a reflection, really, of where the Patterson conductivity of the medium peaks itself. Patterson conductivity is the, the part that's in, in the direction of the electric field. Uh, and on the bottom scale, um, if, you, if you will allow the convention, is micro ergs per cubic centimeter per second is the heating rate, and the electron density is 10 to the fifth in the middle in there. And all this adds up to uh, be quite a few ergs per square centimeter, about seven ergs per square centimeter per second, uh, which is quite a bit larger. I believe, than the amount of heat that normally comes in from the sun on a square centimeter at the equator. On a, on a more disturbed day, just to build things up a little bit, this was in uh, October 11th, which was two days before this previous experiment. We had uh, very substantial electric fields at night. Um, let's see, I can read it better on my graph. Midnight starts on this side and progresses on, and this is 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the northward field, which is the part here is really directed to the south, and it's about uh, 50 to 60 millivolts per meter, which is quite a velocity. And the westward field, as many of you know, was switching back and forth at that time, indicating a, a very complex uh, arc structure uh, in the vicinity. Um, during this time, the, the conductivities jumped around on the top, indicating again a complex uh, precipitation events. The heating rates were quite large, over 20 ergs per square centimeter per second. And I've broken that down again into pieces, and you can see on the top the joule heating rate, which is the amount of energy which is eventually going to end up going into the neutral gas, uh, just due to collisions between ions and neutrals and electrons and ions and neutrals. And uh, that is the same as we saw before. The, the electric field is doing most of the work here by some substantial margin. Uh, there is one point which uh, really should have an error bar attached to it that seems to be that the, uh, the neutral wind may have uh, been doing a little more work on the electric field and vice versa. The neutral wind is, has large excursions in, in the amount of work it's doing, plus and minus, which we expect during times of large-scale convection. Um, and finally, uh, just to show the, the extreme case for the largest we've seen, this was during the August storm 
uh, I needn't show you the electron densities and electric fields and so on. Um, during the first part of the storm, the, the heating rate peaked at 94 ergs per square centimeter per second and uh, dropped very rapidly down to more respectable values and peaked up again at the end of that time, which is uh, nearly noon, uh, when the, uh, the station essentially went under the polar cusp and uh, just due to fortuitous circumstances and went out again. The electric field was doing a considerable amount of work. The neutral wind was doing a very substantial amount of work, which means that we're taking energy out of the wind flow and converting it into thermal components. In turn, that gets... You can't read the scale. Uh, yeah, excuse me. Uh, the scale... I can't see the scale from here either. The scale here goes from 0 to 100 ergs. And this goes from 0 to... It's the same scale. 0, 20, 40, 60. 0, 20, 40, 60. 0, 20, 40, 60. And so on. That's, a hundred, that's about 95 ergs or so. Even though we're pumping this energy into uh, thermal motion in the neutrals, it's going to end up as motion in translation, presumably, in some fashion or another. And it also is a, is a load on the magnetosphere because this is the amount of work that's being done, uh, for the most part, being done on the, on the atmosphere. There are cases, though, as I, we mentioned in the beginning, when uh, the reverse is true and the atmosphere is providing energy to the magnetosphere. Thank you. How much total energy would be involved in this process? Well, I did a quick sketch of, say, taking a rural oval 100 kilometers wide, which is being conservative. That's a one degree of latitude. And say, went around halfway around the Earth. Um, and if we had a heating rate of average of 10 ergs per square centimeter per second, as we do during many of these things, we'd end up with something like 10 to the 16th, 10 to the 17th ergs, you can calculate, per second, which is a fair number. Say 10 to the 16th to be conservative. And of course, if you look at uh, DAP photographs of similar things, you find that the, the oval is really quite a bit wider at times than 100 kilometers, one degree. And so that, uh, let's say between 10 to the 16th and 10 to the 17th ergs per second going into each oval. What, what about during geomagnetic quiet times? Is there a significant amount of joule heating observed by the radar at that particular time? Yes, at quiet times, the radar is usually quite a distance from the oval, the instantaneous oval. Uh, as in the case of the first slide I showed, the heating rate drops down to very low values, much less than one erg down to very small values. And during the daytime, when we're farthest from the oval normally, since it is an oval, not a circle, uh, the rates are down to a very small fraction of an earth per square centimeter per second. There's an observational problem. The heating still goes on, probably, according to Akasofu, but at a higher latitude. You just don't see it. Going back to your numbers of a minute ago, Joe, it looks as if there may be times when this amount of energy input into the atmosphere from the magnetosphere may be significant, significant globally compared to solar EUV input. Yeah, that's I suppose sort of we point. need a good meteorologist here, but does that mean that we're going to have weather phenomena controlled by magnetospheric processes because of circulation? I think in Taylor and Grabowski's presentation earlier, we saw some pretty gross local chemical effects mm -hmm. changing. Uh, I think there probably are fairly, probably during some of these events, gross chemical effects. There certainly is a lot of transport in the neutral gas that's likely to occur. Uh, you have to find a way of communicating the energy in large scale downward through 80 kilometers, through the temperature minimum there. And then you can start talking about weather effects. Uh, my own opinion is I don't see any reason why not. I think if you if you had more information on both spatial gradients in the electric field and time variations in the electric field, that you would probably get figures even greater than what you're getting. Yes, I'm sure. We have and smoothed over a great... Uh, these are measurements that uh, take a half an hour to do, basically. Right. Um, and we've smoothed over a great many fluctuations in space because the medium is moving over us, so we're averaging over a long strip and in time. Okay. And uh, I quite agree with you. That, and then uh, you're also are. taking... I, I think rather narrow zones uh, for the convection, and you weren't really integrating the whole polar cap or anything like that either. No, I, I was purposely being well, conservative in this. Yeah. Uh, at the Solar Terrestrial Conference at Goddard last fall, I 
I think I made some estimates for that, trying to do the <laughs> get a, a bigger picture. And I don't remember the exact figure, but I think it's about two orders of magnitude greater than what you just quoted in terms of yes, total that's, heat. Yes, that's right. It depends on the densities in the, basically the E region or upper E region, 125 kilometers or so. It sometimes can be as, as large as that. Yes. Hebner made one of the points I wanted to make. Uh, the other thing I wanted to comment is that that energy uh, density or energy flux input is comparable to a, mo a moderate aurora. So it's not exactly new that there's that amount of energy uh, flux into the at upper atmosphere. That's uh, that's true in a way. The the aurora during times such as I've shown here are putting in probably an order of magnitude less energy just due to the energetic particles, but it's still a, quite a significant amount, and sometimes they contribute a great deal more. Yeah. That's, that's right, but that is, a, that is indeed a, another source that has to be considered very strongly. Yeah, I'm not, not trying to take yeah, away no, from this, but to say that we already know that this amount of energy uh, that's right. comes down. That's right. Could I make a comment on that last point? Uh, I think the significant difference between the, uh, the, this dual heating and the energy deposition by particles is the altitude at which the two different processes place their heat, and they could produce different dynamical effects in the atmosphere. Yeah, this is placing its energy slightly higher, maybe 20 kilometers, or let's say higher, which makes quite a difference to the neutrals. Just a, a question of curiosity. You said that the ionosphere is able to do work on the magnetosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of what proportion of the time does that uh, happen? Um, it's uh, maybe not the proportion of time, but how much of the total energy. It seems that a lot more goes in than goes out by some very large fraction. Goes into the magnetosphere? No, it goes in. A lot more energy comes from the magnetosphere to the atmosphere than, than vice versa. Yeah. 